Uh, uh, thanks to the Reed family here, Andrew, uh, his wife Betty, and his son Chris, we are hopefully going to have this uh, particular meeting streamed live to the internet and maybe even recorded on YouTube. We'll see what happens. But uh, in any case, if this works out, then this will be a permanent or semi permanent feature. In which case, we're going to be looking for help to uh, operate the equipment to actually uh, make this happen for every meeting, including the uh, recreational astronomy nights. So let's see how it goes, and uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, April uh, Speakers' Night uh, meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre. Uh, I'm the President, Ralph Chu, and uh, it's my pleasure to host the evening. Uh, tonight our uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Harold Pfeiffer who uh, did his um, original studies in Germany and the United Kingdom before he went to Cornell University to get his PhD in 2003. After postdoctoral research at Caltech, uh, he joined the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics in 2009 and he now holds the Canada Research Chair in Numerical Relativity and Gravitational Wave Astrophysics and is a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research. Uh, he has received the Bessel Award of the Humboldt Foundation and an Ontario Early Researcher, uh, Researcher Award. Uh, he does uh, supercomputer calculations uh, to study black holes and general relativity. And uh, he searches for gravitational waves at the LIGO uh, detectors and uh, he looks at how those uh, uh, waves gives him information on black holes and the behavior of gravity in extreme circumstances. So tonight he's going to be speaking about colliding black holes and gravi gravitational waves, seeing the universe through design messages. Please welcome Professor Howard Thank you. Thank you. Wow, good. Thank you for having me here. This is the first live talk I'm giving, I believe. I hope all works out. Um, usually I like to, to tell my audience that I, I'm, I'm happy to take questions anytime, but given that I'm in the floodlights here, I actually don't really see the audience. <laughs> if you have questions, just shout them, or we can also take questions at the end of the talk, I believe. Um, is sound okay? Does this work out? Perfect. Okay, then I just need my slides. I hope these work as well because we've just copied them to a different computer and this is always a somewhat difficult operation. And the mouse tends to disappear. Where's my mouse pointer? Wherever. Okay, so uh, today's topic are the gravitational wave discoveries last year about colliding black holes. And Okay, and so uh, the astrophysical object we are going to talk about are black holes, two black holes that are first orbiting about each other. They are emitting gravitational waves that carry away energy, and so they come closer and closer together uh, until they eventually merge and emit one large pulse of gravitational waves before settling down into as one quiescent remnant black hole. Is it I who's moving the mouse around or is there somebody else? Somebody else. <laughs> Good. And so these black hole collisions were predicted in the gravitational waves about 100 years ago by Albert Einstein and they were first observed in, on September 14th, just one and a half years ago. And so as already pointed out, tonight's to uh, topic for tonight are A, what are black holes? <laughs> uh, what are gravitational waves? And how can one observe gravitational waves? And what has been seen on February 14th, 2015 and November 14th, 2015 and ever since then? Okay, let's get going. Um, black holes some background, what are black holes, what is gravity, and so forth. And well, the 
the very simplest explanation of a black hole is a very lot of matter in a very little volume. In fact, so much matter that not even light can escape. Um, just to get you a sense of, of how much matter and how little volume we're talking about. So here's the sun and an average black hole, the ones we're talking about today, is about 20 times as massive as the sun. Next to the sun is the earth here, uh, wrong distance, but right scale in terms of size. And so the, the average black hole is about 100 times smaller than the earth. I've penciled it in up here right on top of Toronto. It's a little, it's about the, the, the size of the horseshoe region. So we are talking about 20 times the mass of the sun, uh, so roughly 10 million times the mass of the earth, in an area uh, uh, the size of Greater Toronto. So uh, those quite absurd objects actually are believed to exist in nature. And the first evidence for black holes came about with uh, so-called X-ray binaries. Uh, so those are stars, like here's one big massive star, that loses gas onto some other object that's too small to be seen. But as the gas moves towards this object by its gravitational pull and it, it spirals around it, the gas heats up to really high temperatures and emits X-rays, which can be seen with X-ray telescopes and X-ray satellites. And so this is one of these systems called Cygnus X1. For this particular one, uh, actually an astronomer here in Toronto, Bolton in 1972 at the Dunlap Observatory, measured the mass of this object here in the middle. Uh, it figured out it's 15 solar masses combined with a big star of about 20 solar masses. This whole object is, would fit well inside Mercury's orbit. So it's really, really small. And since 1972, there was no better explanation for what the second object could be than a black hole. It can't be a regular star because stars are just too big. And we simply don't know what else it might be. Okay, so uh, very lowest, simplest explanation. Uh, objects so dense that uh, gravity is so strong that light cannot escape. But let's try to, go, to do a little bit better. And let me try to tell you exactly what black holes actually are. And that goes back when we need to talk about gravity, starting with Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. And the next few slides are a little bit more technical, and then it, it goes back and the talk becomes more simplistic again. So, uh, uh, Newton proposed the, the Newtonian theory of gravity, uh, realizing that uh, gravity is an attractive force between any two objects you have. Um, the apple and the earth, because the earth attracts the apple, the apple falls down. Humans and earth, I'm standing here on the, on, the, on the floor because the earth happens to attract me, and I also happen to attract the earth, as well as the earth and the sun. The earth orbits around the sun because of the gravitational attraction between the earth and the sun. And that um, gets me into the, the idea of escape velocity, the, the speed you need to leave a certain body. For the Earth, it turns out to be about 11 kilometers per second. And now you can play games, uh, making the body more massive or bigger and smaller and change that number around. For the Sun, for instance, if you have one times the mass of the Sun and one times the radius of the Sun, the escape velocity from the surface of the Sun would be about 700 kilometers per second. If you make the Earth, the Sun smaller, only still keeping the mass of the sun, but putting it into an object only this, as big as the Earth, the escape velocity would be about 7,000 kilometers per second. Those objects actually exist. Here's an, an image of, of Sirius, the brightest star in, in the sky. It's actually a double star, and there's a little tiny speck next to it. This is a white dwarf that happens to be, have roughly the mass of the sun and happens to be roughly the, Earth, the, the size of the Earth. Well, we can get more extreme and consider what happens if you make the sun even smaller, compress a solar mass into an object about 12 kilometers radius. At that point, the escape velocity becomes 150,000 kilometers. Such objects still exist in the universe, curiously enough. They are called neutron stars and they are left over when 
big stars explode at the end of their life in a supernova explosion. Uh, here's a picture of the Crab Nebula. That supernova exploded in around 1600, was uh, recorded by Chinese astronomers, and it left over a neutron star in the middle. Going further along, making the object smaller and smaller, if we keep the solar mass and compress it into a radius of three kilometers, then the escape velocity would be 300,000 kilometers per second. Does this number sound familiar to anybody here? Yes, it's, it's the speed of light. And so at this point, something strange is bound to happen. And indeed, um, so indeed, a, a one definition for a black hole would be a celestial body so compact that not even light can escape from its surface because the escape velocity is bigger than the speed of light. Uh, sounds like a very good intuitive explanation. Unfortunately, it's not correct. Uh, one reason why it breaks down is that Newtonian gravity, simply Newton's laws of gravity simply don't apply in such extreme fields of gravity. Uh, you need to use different formulas to describe what happens and how gravity operates. The second problem with, with the picture of escape velocity and light is that the speed of light actually is constant. Light always moves at 300,000 kilometers per second. If I shoot a light ray vertically upward from a really compact object like the ones I was just talking about, light continues to move at 300,000 kilometers per second. It, it's not slowing down. It's just getting redshifted, its frequency changes. So uh, this very simple picture doesn't really work uh, besides building intuition. And to do better, we need to go back to Newton and talk a little bit more about what actually goes into, new, into the Newtonian picture of gravity. One thing that's always assumed, and I'm, I'm this time actually putting it up for certain, is that in order to talk about Newtonian gravity, one starts with an immutable space and time. You assume you know what space is, what time is, before you actually put bodies into the space and time in order to have an arena in which the sun and the earth moves. Um, this is indicated in this, this kind of hyperspace view here by this green sheet, uh, which is nice and rec uh, regular X and Y coordinates. So you know where the sun is, you know where the earth is. And then uh, putting in sun and earth, uh, what Newton postulated was that there's a force between sun and earth that obeys a certain formula. And that tells the Earth to move towards the Sun, and that turns the Sun to move towards the Earth. Uh, the force acts at a distance, and the force acts instantaneously. So that, that left for a few hundred, a few hundred years this, this odd feeling of, yeah, but how exactly does the Earth know that it moves? Um, well, even if we didn't figure out why the Earth knew to move the way it does, uh, this simple picture of how gravity works, works remarkably well and almost perfectly can describe and predict any motion that's happening in the solar system, the motion of planets, the motion of satellites, and so forth. Uh, however, it fails in, in very minute aspects. Um, the motion of the perihelion advance of Mercury isn't described perfectly, and the global positioning system wouldn't work at all if you just used Newtonian gravity to describe it. It's, it's just not accurate enough for those, uh, approxim uh, for those tasks. Well, to do better, you need uh, to bring in the biggest physicist of the 20th century, Albert Einstein, who in 1915, within a few weeks' time, wrote a few papers about a different theory to describe how gravity works. And the Einsteinian picture is radically different from, from the Newtonian picture. First of all, it starts out with uh, postulating that space and time are warped. Um, Warpage of space means that the usual uh, geometric formulas you've learned in school, like the circumference of a radius is, I've lost my mouse pointer, the circumference of a, of a circle is 2 pi times the radius, that this type of formulas don't work anymore. For instance, if you consider the sun again, the circumference of the sun is different from 2 pi times the radius, uh, the circumference is smaller by about a part in a million, about uh, 20 kilometers less than 2 pi times the radius. 
Time is also warped, which manifests itself that time flows at different speeds in different parts of, of the solar system. Specifically, the deeper in a, pot in a gravitational potential one is, the more slowly time flows. By now, uh, atomic clocks here on Earth have reached a precision that if I, if I had two atomic clocks and would place one on the desk here and the other one on the floor, because the floor is closer to the center of the Earth, uh, that clock would record time flowing more slowly by about a part in a, a thousand billions. Not very much, but the clocks are so re remarkably accurate, they can actually measure the difference. So, space and time can be warped, and this is indicated here by this green hyperspace view of our space being no longer just flat, but actually being curved down in this, this ribbon-like structure. And the warpage of space arises by mass in the space itself. So the sun is very massive, it warps space quite a bit. The Earth is much less massive, so it warps space only a tiny weeny bit down here. This warpage of space travels through space at the speed of light, and it's the warpage that tells the bodies inside the space how to move. So in this picture, the sun warps space and time. Those warpages travel out to the location of the Earth, and it's now the curvature of space where the Earth is sitting uh, that, that is, the Earth is sensitive to, and it's that curvature that tells the Earth how to accelerate and how to move. So, by introducing warped space and warped time, uh, this way of viewing gravity gets around the action of, at a distance and uh, the instantaneous action. So, it's, it's a very radical picture, um, but as I show you later, it actually works out in, in reality. Black holes now, coming back to black holes, black holes are bodies that, that push the warpage of space and time to the extreme. So here under the sun, uh, the space is just curved a little bit. If I turn it into a black hole, you can view it as, as the space being ripped, basically, and the warpage becoming extre uh, infinite. Um, in fact, the, uh, the relationship between circumference around a black hole and, and radius through the black hole is completely broken in that uh, the distance through a black hole would actually be infinite. And as already pointed out earlier, the warpage of, of space and time manifests itself in the curvature of space. Also in the slowing of flow of time, uh, near black holes, the, the flowing of time is slowed down so extremely that clocks actually can stop. And if the black hole happens to be rotating, then you can have, you have a, a tornado-like swirling motion of the space itself around the black hole. Okay, so now, how does this picture of having a certain size of a black hole and having a light not being able to escape come about in, in, in this picture now? Uh, this diagram, I'm plotting a few light rays that start at a certain distance, say here, from the center of the black hole. And as I go up in this diagram, this corresponds to going forward in time. And so as I go forward in time, these light rays starting out at large distance from the black hole, they of course move upwards forward in time, but they also move to bigger distances, as you would expect. If you shoot a light ray some, uh, uh, away from, from some, some object, the light is actually moving away from it. If I now consider starting the light rays closer and closer from the black hole, something odd happens. The light ray, despite moving at the speed of light as always, doesn't seem to be getting away as quickly as it could, as it should. And if I go even closer, the light ray will first essentially hang at the same distance for quite a while until eventually moving away. If I were to go even a little bit further in, this is still a light ray that moves away from the center as quickly as it can, but because the space is warped so much, it actually moves, despite moving away, it actually comes closer and closer to the center. It feels totally counterintuitive, but unfortunately this is how, how the, the universe actually works in these extremely 
uh, strong gravitational fields. If you fine tune a little bit more at the distance you, you want to start your light ray, there's one magic case here in the middle where the light ray just stays at the same distance from the center of the black hole, despite moving outward at the speed of light. And this magic line is called what's called the event horizon. It's actually a sphere um, because I have been suppressing the remaining spatial dimensions here to make it to put it on, on the, the diagram. It's a spherical, it's a sphere in, in, in vacuum that once you're beyond, there's no way to return back to the outside because of the strong gravity of, of space and time. Okay, enough of black holes. Let's go back to actually talking about more of the newer, more interesting astro astrophysical observations. Here again is our Cygnus X1 system. And one way how black holes form is when massive stars like this one over here explode in the end of their lives in a supernova explosion. 20 solar masses turns out to be right at the edge where this star could perhaps form a neutron star or it could form a black hole, so it's, we don't really know it. But we do know that in the future, this star here will turn into either a neutron star or black hole. And then suddenly we have two of these compact objects uh, that are orbiting about each other. This black hole, by the way, as well, was formed earlier by the collapse of an even more massive star than the 20 solar masses here. If you now have two of, the, of these tiny compact objects going about each other, in this um, curved space warp time picture, what you have is that each one of these two objects is warping space and time, and these warpages is traveling around at the speed of light. And this leads to these waves of, of warped space and time propagating away from these orbiting black holes. And these are precisely the gravitational waves I was alluding to earlier, perturbations in space and time itself, that travel at the speed of light. They're generated by accelerating masses. Uh, the strongest waves come from most fastest moving objects and most massive objects like, like the binary black holes. Okay, Einstein knew about gravitational waves. He wrote, wrote them approximately down in 1916 already and realized that in, in one of his formulas, this is the formula he had in 1916, there was some numerical number here in front that was exceedingly small, uh, 10 to the minus 27. And so Einstein said, well, because this number is so, so, so small, gravitational waves exist, but they will never be of any practical use whatsoever. So uh, just, for, just a theoretician's dream. What has happened since then is that black holes were discovered and the black holes are just so much smaller and so much move so much more quickly when they are in binaries that they emit immensely stronger gravitational waves than the regular stars that were known at Einstein's time. Plus also the uh, technology to detect gravitational waves has been astonishingly improved. So when a gravitational wave passes by Earth, this is what's going to happen. The, the wave as it passes by squeeze, stretches and squeezes space in orthogonal directions alternatively. And <clears throat> towards the end where the squeezing and stretching was, was biggest, this is when the waves came by from the collision of the two black holes I was showing you in, in the movie earlier. But in this uh, movie, of course, the effect is, is exaggerated in order to see anything here at all. And just the amount by which we, this is exaggerated is, is a, totally astonishing as well. So I need to remind you of a, sm a few small numbers. The size of the hair, diameter of a hair is about 0.1 millimeters. And the hair is about a million atoms across. And an atom itself has an extremely tiny atomic nucleus in the center, which is again about 100,000 times smaller than the atom itself. If, you've, if you have counting lengths, we are now at a size of about 10 to the minus 15 meters. So if, if a strong gravitational wave, the biggest one we, we can imagine, passes by Earth, it stretches and squeezes Earth by roughly the size of an atomic nucleus, one part in 10 to the minus 15 meters, or one in a hundred thousandth the size of an atom. 
it's it's totally mind-boggling. To make matters worse, the LIGO instruments cannot be as big as the Earth. They must be smaller. And so the where's my mouse? Here we go. The the deformation of the LIGO system itself is about 1,000 times smaller than a nucleus, or about a one and a hundred millionth time the size of an atom. So we have to measure these exceedingly small changes in length in order to, to detect gravitational waves. And just to remind you, these, these are the, the strongest gravitational waves we could ever imagine happening in our universe. So detecting these things is extremely difficult. And nevertheless, it was done by the LIGO instruments. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's actually two identical uh, instruments built at opposite ends of, of the United States. I'll explain to you later why we have two of them. And each one of these is a big L-shaped object where each one of these L arms is four kilometers long. What's now inside this, this L-shaped object uh, is a laser system that sends laser beams back and forth along the arms. And if the end mirrors change a little bit, as just indicated by this movie, uh, the amount of the way the light bounces back and forth in the laser system changes, and that then makes it possible to actually detect the gravitational wave. So light has a certain wavelength, and the system is usually set up such that at the output port, nothing comes out of the system, perfect destructive interference, but if now the end laser changes a little bit their, their position, the facing of the waves between the two arms changes, and there is a little bit of output light coming out here on this side. And it's essentially measuring the light coming out here that allows LIGO to become sensitive enough to actually detect this astonishingly minute changes in length. Um, a few pictures. Here's the, the, the detector in, Liv in Louisiana Livingston again. And this picture here is right here in the center of the, the vertex of the L. Uh, you see the, the letters here. So these vacuum systems are about four to six meters high. They're remarkably huge vacuum systems, actually the biggest vacuum systems in the world. Um, Inside of it hangs uh, extremely sophisticated and sensitive uh, uh, technology. Here's one of the LIGO mirrors where the light is bouncing back and forth. There's about 40 centimeters diameter, weighing 40 kilograms. It's, the, it's one of the most perfect mirrors ever made. It reflects 99.999999% of all the incident light. Um, and a few more pictures of just all the astonishing technology that, that goes into this instrument. Uh, the instrument is really difficult to, to build, and so it is constructed and run by, a, by the LIGO scientific collaboration that involves about a thousand scientists scattered in about 70 or 80 different institutions uh, all over the world, quite a large number of them in North America and the US, uh, also quite a few in Europe, India, uh, Asia, Australia, and, and Brazil. So it's a worldwide enterprise. And uh, Canada is represented by the University of Toronto, uh, our research group at, at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. And Canada is also, inter is also uh, represented by a, quite a large number of expatriates uh, Canadians that ended up having faculty position or research positions elsewhere in the world. And I'm just listing a few of them. Kip Cannon from York University is now at Tokyo. Cholin Creighton from uh, St. Francis Xavier is at the University of Wisconsin. Um, Jocelyn Reed from UBC. And Mike Landry is actually now the, the lead person at the LIGO Hanford Observatory. So it's a big effort with a lot of people involved. Another big effort is actually to work out what the Einstein equations actually predict how black holes should behave. I've shown you all these nice movies, and those actually are perfect, precise solutions of Einstein's equations. They're not just some, some artist's sketches. These movies are really what happens. And 
they are computed by my group and my collaboration here on in Toronto uh, using Canadian computers. Uh, and the importance for knowing the precise shapes of the gravitational waveforms that are emitted when black holes collide is, is manifold. For one, it actually makes it possible to tune the, uh, the instruments to look precisely for those signals to make them easier to find. And then also, it, it helps to, to figure out what we actually have seen. I'm coming back to this point in a, in a few minutes. Here's a rough timeline over the last 100 years leading up to the observation of gravitational waves. Um, they were first put forward by, by Albert Einstein in 1915. It took about 40 years or so to figure out what black holes actually are from the theoretician side. And the term black hole only came into existence in the 1950s. Uh, the first ideas how, how to build LIGO-like instruments were done in the 1970s. Uh, LIGO was founded in 84. The first LIGO instruments, the first generation of them, began to be built in 94. And this first generation of instruments took data between 2002 and 2010 without success, unfortunately. The waves in the universe aren't strong enough. And then between 2010 and 2015, LIGO was improved and upgraded to a more sensitive advanced LIGO instrument. And that's where life got interesting. And that's now where we are switching over to what happened one and a half years ago on September 14th, where first the um, instrument in, in Washington, in Hanford, uh, detected a signal that first was nothing and then it began to oscillate up and down at increasing frequency, so the wavelength becomes shorter, and with higher and higher amplitudes, until eventually uh, the signal goes away and everything is, is flat again. This, this whole thing is only about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 seconds long. What I'm calling flat here at the end, as well at the beginning, this is the, the usual behavior of the instrument. It's never absolutely perfectly quiet, it always has some background noise in it, like the noise of the speakers here, which one simply cannot get rid of. <laughs> Except that for the LIGO, this background noise is, of, is, of, is at a, a magnitude of 10 to the minus 21, so exceedingly tiny. So far, so good. Uh, and this signal here, with first long wavelength, low amplitude, and then short wavelength, high amplitude, corresponds to the system I was talking about earlier, two black holes orbiting about each other first at large separation, coming closer, orbiting faster, and eventually merging into one bigger black hole. So, so far this looks good. The true excitement came seven milliseconds later, when the other instrument in Louisiana uh, recorded this blue curve, which is overlaid with the red curve, and you see that pretty much every single wiggle agrees with each other. So we have two instruments a few thousand kilometers apart that recorded precisely the same signal, and that signal actually looked like we would expect it to look like. And because we have seen it twice in two independent instruments, that gives the confidence that this really is an astrophysical event and not just some fluke in the detector. After all, What's happening here is that the mirror is moving by this ridiculously small amount only, uh, 100 million times the size of an atom. So we needed two of them to be sure that they actually, what we are seeing is real. At that point, uh, oh, 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 oh. at that point, uh, computer calculations come in again, and we are computing uh, how these waveforms should look like for different masses and different spins for the black holes. And by comparing the computer calculation prediction with the actual observation, we could uh, derive that what's actually happened is that these were two black holes close to equal mass that were orbiting about each other, like in, in this uh, movie. So this movie shows the black holes in the top part. And here in the middle, this colored coded plane is the equatorial plane where artificially I put a depth in to correspond to the, to the warpage of space, and I put colors on this plane that corresponds to the slowing down of the rate of flow of, of time. 
So red is the slowest flow of time, and that's closest where the black holes are. I've, I've lifted the black holes somewhat up to one, so one can see both things. Now the black holes are actually merging with each other, and a new common horizon forms around both of them. The movie stopped for a second or two, and now the remnant black hole has settled down. And what you see in blue and, and purple is now the gravitational waves of this merger propagating through the universe at the speed of light, and eventually, quite a while later, hitting Earth. So this is what we believe has happened, and what caused this particular measurement in LIGO. And <clears throat> this is another important part where the computer calculations come in. The top panel shows the measurement. The middle panel shows the, the computer calculation of what Einstein's theory, what Einstein actually, the equation Einstein wrote down 100 years ago, actually predicted. And it looks pretty similar to the eye. If you subtract these two from each other, you get this thing down here, where you don't have any noticeable signal left anymore, uh, as well for the Livingston detector and, and as well for the Hanford detector. And it's the fact that the computer calculation matches so perfectly with the actual observation that now confirms that we the black gravitational waves that were seen actually are coming from colliding black holes, and that these black holes really behave like I've described you earlier, despite all the craziness and, 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 the, and, and the fantastic nature of, of what black holes are. And so that's yet another astonishing vindication of, of Einstein's genius uh, writing down a, a so fundamentally different and, and nevertheless so good theory of how gravity works a hundred years ago. Okay, but one cool thing is we can also the frequency of these gravitational waves that were observed are roughly 100 hertz. This is the, the band where uh, human ear is also sensitive. And so we can now transcribe the, the mirror motion of the LIGO mirrors into sound. And we'll get sound out of it that starts at low frequencies and, and quite soft and then becomes louder and at higher frequency. It's called a chirp signal. And so the first half of each pass is just the usual detector noise, like the speakers here. And then the second half of each, each pass is where the actual signal is put in the sound. And so this is how gravitational waves would sound. Uh, you might wonder why there's two different versions here. Uh, we had to down scale the time axis because the actual event only takes 0.1 seconds and that's too short to listen to and there's different ways how you can do this downscaling and we tried two ways in the collaboration and uh, if you have a thousand people you, you always get different opinions so some like the one better others like the other better um, and it was eventually decided to keep both versions in this movie. Okay, so just to remind you of the sizes of the things that are, that are going about here, we have two black holes, one about 29 times the mass of the sun, the other about 35 times the mass of the sun, separated roughly by the distance between Toronto and Quebec City. And they are moving about at about 50,000 kilometers per second and orbiting around about 20 times per second. So imagine going between Toronto and Quebec 20 times per second and coming back. It's, it's totally mind-boggling. And the amount of energy emitted is uh, roughly as much as uh, 100,000 million, million, million suns, or about 50 times the entire rest of the universe combined. For this 0.1 second that the black holes actually emit noticeable gravitational waves. So for a very brief period of time, at the very end of this in spiral of the two black holes, this explosion of the two black holes colliding is, is more luminous than anything else in the universe. But all this energy goes into gravitational waves and you wouldn't be able to see anything with, with a regular telescope at all. It's just an, an astonishing 
concept to wrap your, your mind about. Um, the origin of the gravitational waves is in the southern hemisphere coming from this uh, circle-shaped region uh, near the large Magellanic cloud. And uh, the black hole collision was about 1.3 billion light years away. So the collision happened 1.3 billion years ago. And that's how long the gravitational waves took to, to travel to Earth um, at the speed of light. Okay, LIGO, of course, didn't stop taking data after we were successful. It kept running. And the entire first LIGO observing run went from middle of September until middle of January 2015-2016. In this time frame, two other exciting events were seen. A second black hole coalescence at Christmas Day, at Boxing Day, which is shown here in this movie. It's at a more unequal mass ratio, so the little black hole is, is smaller. And again, pretty much the same happens as before. The, the black holes first orbit about each other, but then the, 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 they merge with each other. And in October, there's a candidate event, which is probably a binary black hole as well, but we're only about 90% sure that it actually is a real signal. And there's a 10% chance that, that this middle event could have been just some random artifact in the detector. So I, I tend to joke we have seen 2.9 binary black holes because this one here is only 90% sure. These three black holes are, these three binary black holes now make nine black holes in total because each binary black hole starts out by two black holes like this one is the first one, which merge into one even bigger one. Um, here, uh, they are all shown in the respective sizes they actually have. And so the, the first one I've been talking about were, were the most massive ones, 29 and 35 solar masses. The Boxing Day one was the least massive one, about 7 and 15 solar masses. And the one in the middle was literally in the middle. Uh, also in the middle in terms of size, about 15 and 25 solar masses. So we've now been actually been able to do astronomy with these objects already uh, because we already have learned quite a lot of new facts that simply weren't accessible any other way than with gravitational waves. The most obvious fact is that black holes, binary black holes actually exist in the universe. We didn't know this before because Black holes don't emit light, and so there was no other way of, of seeing and observing binary black holes. Um, we know that these binary black holes also merge with each other, otherwise we wouldn't have gravitational waves. And in fact, um, if you work out how often two black holes somewhere in the universe collide, it's about once every 15 minutes. So during this talk, already there should have been two or three pu bursts, pulses of gravitational waves passing through this room as well. Unfortunately, all two or three of them would have been way too weak for even for LIGO to detect them. So we, we need to wait until the, by, by chance, one of these binary black holes collides with each other much, much closer to Earth than, than on average. We also have learned that unexpectedly massive stellar mass black holes exist. So here on the y-axis are the masses of the black holes. The first two from the LIGO ones are 29 and 35 solar masses. And the previously known black holes from these X-ray binaries I talked at the very beginning about, the 15 solar mass black hole, Cygnus X1, is actually the most massive of those. And those have somewhere between 5 and 15 solar masses. And nobody ever had seen anything like a 30 solar mass or 35 solar mass black hole before. So this, again, is, is a new insight in astronomy that arose already through the very first detections of gravitational waves. Okay, so LIGO is only two instruments of a growing gang of gravitational wave detectors. Um, there's another smaller one in, in Germany already operating, and in, in a LIGO-like one in, in, in Italy called Virgo is going to join LIGO in, in the coming weeks. 
There's also one under construction in Japan and one planned in India. So in, in about five or seven years, we should have one, two, three, four, five big sensitive gravitational wave detectors, plus the somewhat smaller one in, you, in Germany. For a worldwide network of gravitational wave detectors, that will be able to extract even more information from the gravitational waves and that will be able to see even more gravitational wave events than, than just the two LIGOs by themselves. The time scale for LIGO and Virgo, the two best developed systems, is as follow, follows. LIGO again, quite now, is taking data again, is it's in observing mode. Um, it started taking data again in November 2016, and it's going to take data until about August this year. The data is presently being analyzed, and so uh, there's a good chance of more binary black holes being in this data set. Then LIGO is going to turn down, uh, turn off again, to get uh, for more technical work to make it more sensitive. It will uh, be switched on again in 2018. Then more work making it more sensitive, and eventually it's supposed to be as good as it ever gets and will be running continuously. The Italian Virgo system is a little bit behind. Um, it should have its first science run sometime soon, joining LIGO in the coming months, and then going through the same pattern of making it more sensitive, taking data, making it more sensitive, taking data, than the LIGO instruments. So there's, there's quite a bit more measurements and data coming in the future. And so the, the important questions to ask about are, uh, how do, are, the, are we going to see more binary black holes and what are the masses and spins of these binary black holes? How much variety is there in the black holes? This will teach us about how black holes form and how supernova explosions work. And then there's also a lot of other types of compact binaries, which unfortunately, because I've reordered slides, I haven't told you about yet. So for uh, ignore this bullet point for the time being. Um, and there might be even other things for binary black holes. Here are a collection of other types of sources for binary black holes. One of them are two neutron stars that are orbiting about each other and eventually colliding with each other. Or a black hole and a neutron star combined. Um, because all of these are, uh, so this is actually an artist's movie, this is a real computer calculation, but if we are running things in the computer, we, have, we are perfectly free to color code things however we feel convenient. And so in this particular case, uh, the neutron star matter happens to be color coded blue. And as the neutron star gets too close to the black hole, it is being shredded into pieces by the strong gravity of the black hole. And there are these tidal day tails of ejected material that now propagates out in the, into the universe. Other sources of gravitational waves that LIGO is looking for are individual rotating neutron stars or the big collisions that make black holes in the first place, the, the supernova explosions. Uh, those should also emit gravitational waves uh, that are that is being searched for. From my own perspective, I'm right now most excited about these two things up here, the two neutron stars colliding with each other or the black hole and the neutron star colliding with each other. The reason why I'm so excited about these systems is that with the neutron stars, you have matter in the system. And once you have matter, hydrogen, gas, neutrons, anything, um, that matter will emit normal electromagnetic radiation, light, radio waves, X-rays, all of those. And so once you have this type of system, there's a pretty good chance that normal telescopes will also be able to pick up the radiation from this matter here. And then we could see one and the same system, both with gravitational waves and with all the other telescopes that are scattered all across the Earth. Um, LIGO runs a joint observation program with uh, astronomy teams. And even for the first black hole detections, uh, about 60 astronomy teams have actually pointed all types of telescopes into the respective sky direction, trying to find electromagnetic counterparts. And 
for the black holes, nothing was seen. So this was essentially a, a just a test, a practice run. But for neutron star black holes or binary neutron stars, this will become really, really exciting in the future. Okay, that's all I had. So I'm closing here with one of my favorite cartoons from the gravitational wave announcement last year. Hey, was that you I just heard now? Or was it two black holes colliding? So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Um, I should also point out, and I'll just leave this slide up here during the, the question session, that the next six weeks happen to be a bonanza if you're interested in learning about black holes and gravitational waves and, and the, the, the universe. Um, there's two more public lectures at the University of Toronto, one on May 4th and the other one on May 24, both of them about the LIGO and gravitational waves. And the uh, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research wants an, a, a full day program uh, discussing all things to do with, with cosmology, cosmos, cosmic microwave background, gravitational waves, also in May here in the Science Center. All these events are for the public. Uh, the lectures on the left you can just go to. For the CFA uh, program you have to sign up in advance, but as I said, it's, it's open to the public. Um, with that announcement, I'm now taking any questions you might have about uh, my talk. Yeah. Yes, I'm curious when, when the gravity wave comes through the distance, I guess, at 1 p.m., why isn't light affected by the same thing or its frequency changes? How come light notices that the distance is different? Because light gets affected by gravity waves too, I think. Um, so, <sighs> Gravity waves behave exactly like light. Um, they move at the same speed of light, and, and, and if the binary black holes would emit light as well, that light would have traveled to, to the Earth as the gravity waves and would have taken the same 1.3 billion years. So there's, there's no really difference in how gravity waves and light propagate. Yeah, but I'm, I'm curious why light notices the, the arm of the interferometer is a little bit longer. Why is the light stretched? Ah, that's an, that's an excellent question. Um, there's, there's quite a few different ways how you can visualize that. The, the simplest one is that the wavelength of the gravitational wave is actually quite a bit longer than the light travel time through the instrument. And so um, the, the light going back and forth always sees only the instantaneous location of the mirrors and it doesn't really see the, the slowly, the comparatively slow stretching of space and time. Yeah. Is there any relationship between black holes and dark energy or dark matter? Um, Could it be a source of dark matter? So it, 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 it oh, one idea of, of dark matter, so, so if, if, let me explain briefly what dark matter is. So if, if you look at the, how stars and galaxies move in the universe, how much they de decelerate, you can work out how much mass there should be in the universe. If you now sum up everything you see, all the stars, all the galaxies, you find that everything you see is only about a fifth or so of the amount of matter you need to make the, the universe move the way it actually does. The rest of the stuff that we don't see was termed dark matter. It's always good to have a catchy name. And one proposal early on of what dark matter might be were indeed it could be black holes that are scattered throughout the universe and that because they're black and quiescent, you don't see them. Um, by now, uh, this is pretty much impossible in that there's uh, essentially for all different sizes of possible black holes, they have been excluded as a, as a source for, for dark matter. The only sliver left, and this was one point that actually caught the interest of people one, a year ago, the only sliver barely left are black holes of roughly 30 solar masses. So it's, it's not completely 
impossible that these 30 solar mass black holes might be dark matter, but it's it's quite improbable. It's been going on for you know, billions of years, perhaps, that these black holes have been absorbing visible matter. And where does that go? If you conserve in matter and energy, where does it go? Yep. Okay. Are the different detectors aligned differently, so that's how you can tell where it came from? Or is it like the L shape? different orientations? Excellent question. So the way we can tell the, where the gravitational wave is coming from is, is essentially from the time delay between the detectors. Like the human ear, if, if sound uh, reaches my right ear before my left ear, I know that the source of the sound is somewhere on my right hand side. And this is where more than two detectors help. If you have three or four or five, you can much better triangulate because you have many more different time differences where you can work out where the source is coming from. The second point where, thing is, where this is important is there's actually two different flavors of gravitational waves. They have two different polarizations. And it turns out if you have just one L, you can only measure one of the two. If you had two Ls that, have, that are 45 degrees rotated with relative to each other, then you would be a sense that each one of the detectors would be sensitive to one of the two polarizations and you would get twice the amount of, of, of information. Um, but now, because the two detectors measure different things, you can't just claim that you can't use them to, to, to increase confidence that what you're seeing is actually real. For LIGO, the choice was made to build the two Ls in the identical orientation to each other. Um, so they only see 50% of the possible information, but they both see the same. And so you can actually make the cross correlation to be confident that you have seen something. And now with the more detectors coming online, they will be oriented differently. And so with the bigger network, we will be able to see both, both polarizations. Like, get different um, amplitudes of it because they're turned different ways? Yep, that too. So the, the, the amplitude also changes if you rotate the, the instrument around a little bit. And this, is, uh, this also helps in, in determining the sky location of the event. How, how gravity fit into this picture? Or this instrument can tell us anything about graviton? Okay, so the, the graviton is, is the quantum mechanical particle that, that uh, transmits gravity through the universe. Um, only indirectly. So. The black holes that, that LIGO is seeing are so big things that quantum mechanics isn't really important at all. If you work out how many gravitons are emitted, it's something like 10 to the 80, so a, a really vast number. What, what can be done with this type of events is to measure how, mass, how big the mass of the graviton could be. If the graviton is, has a mass, then gravitational waves of different frequencies would propagate it with different speeds through the universe. And so when I'm now showing these, wherever I have the Im images, when I'm showing these, these shapes of the waveforms here, um, the computer calculation is the shape of the waveform that is emitted by the system. And this shape now propagates for a billion years through the universe. It has different frequencies. It has low frequencies and high frequencies. And after a billion years, what arises, what arrives on Earth has still the same temporal correlation between the high and the low frequencies. So this is an astonishingly accurate measurement that gravitational waves of different frequencies move with the same speed. And that therefore, the mass of the graviton must be exceedingly small. And so what, what LIGO has done is that it has already used this, this type of measurement to, to set a bound on, on how small the mass of the graviton uh, can, is still allowed to be. Yeah. How do you know what the masses of the black holes are? By comparing with the computer calculations. So it turns out if you now change the masses of the black holes around, the shape of the waveforms will differ. The, the frequencies could be higher or lower. The 
time it takes to go from low frequencies to high frequencies can be different. The number of wickles can be more wickles or fewer wickles. And so you adjust all these, you try out a lot of different masses and you then work out which ones, which masses actually are, give you a signal that is identical to the one observed. of the wave and it's compressed at the front but it's cone shaped and stretched out at the back. Would that suggest it's meeting resistance along the way <laughs> over the centuries that, and billions of years? That, that's an excellent question. Um, and unfortunately, I, I don't think so. So the, the funny thing here is, is um, that this looks like it's it's some something moving to the right, and so it looks like um, this part here on the right hand side is compressed, and then then behind it's it's uh, different. Uh, but this is only an artifact of the way the stuff is plotted. So here's the time axis. It turns out what's plotted on the left is what is arriving on Earth first, and so it, this long frequency stuff is actually what comes to Earth first. And this one here comes 0.1 seconds later. In some sense, you, you should imagine this, this thing moving to the left and not to the right. You mentioned the, the potential for events that would have observable radiation associated with the collision. How would that be achieved? Would telescopes have to monitor a candidate patch of sky, or would they be aimed at it after the event is detected wider? This is an excellent question again. So the way this is going to work is that LIGO is continuously monitoring the data it is observing as it comes in, and there's automatic detection programs continuously running that are searching for candidate signals. And so these events, within a few seconds, of uh, identify, hey, here could actually be something in the data. And because we're currently not so confident yet that everything works perfectly, at that point, uh, cell phones go off all, all across the, the globe, and a few human beings look at the data by eye and, and make sure, oh yeah, the, the detector is, is in a good state and, and we trust the data. And then perhaps 10 to 20 minutes, this may, may take 10 or 20 minutes, and then we send notifications out to all the astronomers. And so within about half an hour of, of the something being measured by LIGO, the astronomers get a, a, a message, hey, there could be something in, in this region of the sky, and we believe it's a black hole, we believe it's a neutron star. And at that point, the astronomers can uh, turn on and, and get in touch with any telescopes they have access to. And then those telescopes will point in the appropriate region of the sky and, and, and try to find something there. Um, pretty much all the big telescopes, well, on the big telescopes, you can't just observe. You have to send, you write a proposal. I want to use the telescope to do A, B, and C. And if you're successful, then, then you get the time on the telescopes. And all these tele usually the time is allocated weeks and months in advance that you know, oh, I'm going to have the telescopes on, on May 15th. But there's, there are these target of opportunity programs that if something urgent comes up along because some event that only happens very rarely, then these regular programs get interrupted and uh, astronomers that do this type of urgent work get immediate access to the telescopes and then can go off and, and look. Yeah. So for events like a supernova eruption that might still have maybe a, because of the sensitivity of the LIGO at the moment and it would might still be buried within the data, are you at the moment uh, consulting with, say, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, so whenever they ever get a surge of neutrons, you're going to get a phone call that'll say, check the data, neutrino, sorry. This, this is an excellent question. So I've, I've described the, uh, the cooperation by LIGO sending information to the astronomers, but the same also happens the opposite way around. Uh, 
Yes, we are in contact with the neutrino observatories, and we are also in contact with uh, gamma ray bursts. Uh, and luckily, from the LIGO perspective of things, we can record every single bit of data we have. So we can look in our, at our data a week or a month later, and there's still everything there, and we haven't lost any information. So the, the information feedback the opposite way tends to happen on, on more slower, more careful time scales, like a week or a month or so. But this, this is done as well, this type of, of course, correlation. Yeah? How much data is actually collected then, like in terms of volume? Because I hear in some of the projects they collect like massive, massive amounts of data every second. Com comparatively little. Um, so the, the actual science data, the gravitational wave shape, um, there's only uh, two detectors, and the data is sampled at 16 kilohertz. So you have five months of data at 16 kilohertz. That's, that's a few gigabytes of data. Um, if LIGO also has a few thousand extra monitoring channels, temperature, magnetic fields, seismic motion, uh, and many, many other things. I'm, I'm not even sure what it are, they are. And even if you collect all these thousands of different auxiliary channels, uh, you're still only talking about a, a few hundred terabytes of data. I'm just curious, how destructive are these gravitational waves at like close range? Like, if there's a planet 10 light years away, would it disrupt the planet? No, not at all. Um, the, the, the waves are ex ex excessively weak, even if you're quite close to the system. So if, if, you, are, if you imagine the, the, the two black holes merge, say, at the center of our solar system, even at the distance of the Earth, um, the human body wouldn't notice anything at all. Because even there, this, the stretching and squeezing is already too small to be noticeable by with, with our human senses. I, I should move to this side because this, I, think, I think this side of the room is this. this. Uh, I understand this proposal for building uh, observatories in space. Yes. That's still on track. Is it possible? Yes. So there is also a gravitational wave detector planned to be sent into space. It consists of three satellites that are shooting laser beams be between them. And the big advantage in space, you can move the satellites further away from each other. That way you can find gravitational waves at, at longer wavelengths, gravitational waves that are emitted by so-called supermassive black holes that are a million times the, the mass of the sun, instead of just the puny ones 30 times the mass of the sun. <laughs> Um, the, the so-called LISA mission is, is on track to be launched in the around 2030. <laughs> yeah, there are massive black holes, really massive ones with a million, a billion solar masses. Do they travel through space indefinitely? And would like closer to the waves, would it affect the thing more? Like, so would the waves basically travel forever? Like, there's nothing to lose. Space, Look, it's just yes. So it, it's a good enough. I described to you how how minute the impact of gravitational waves are on the matter they pass through. This is a bad thing if you want to detect them. On the other side, it's an excellent thing because that means once a gravitational wave is generated and is, is propagating through the universe, nothing will stop them. They will just go on forever and ever. They will also pass through any ma ma material that, that is in their way without being affected by it. For the black hole waves, that doesn't really matter too much. Um, the ones they came actually passed through the Earth from the southern hemisphere, but no problem whatsoever. Where this gets really interesting is for, for the supernova explosions. Um, because the gravitational waves that are made in a supernova explosion would come right from the middle, where all the activity happens, where the neutron star is being formed or the black hole is being formed. Whereas the, the light of the supernova that, is, that you can see quite easily, that light is coming from the outer layers of the material that is being blown off, 
And that light is typically emitted a month later. And so the light from the supernova is, is very, very indirect if you want to learn about what happens in the middle. But the gravitational waves come directly from the middle, if we can ever detect them from a supernova. Um, they only weaken because of uh, the, the, the usual geometric factors. Uh, the same happens with light. If you have a light bulb flushing, the further away from the light bulb you are, the weaker it looks like. The same is true for gravitational waves. As, as they continually travel further through the universe, their amplitude becomes smaller and smaller. Gravitational waves, are they stretched by the expansion of the universe? Yes. So the further away something is, the more its waves would be stretched. Would that help us measure how far away it happened? <laughs> um, the, so the, the waves are stretched. The, the way we know the distance to the source is by by this, this, this effect with the amplitude becoming smaller. By the shape, we know the masses of the black holes. If the shape itself is elongated, yes. wouldn't that make calculating the black hole size? It, 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 makes, it, it, makes, it, it makes it more difficult, and, and you need to, to put everything together if you want to do it carefully. Mm -hmm. But roughly speaking, from the shape, you get the masses. And then, once you know the masses, and you know that the amplitude of the waves goes down with distance, knowing what the amplitude is you have measured here on Earth will then tell you how far away it is. And at that point, you need to do it self-consistently, working into the shape, the redshift of the waves as they travel to Earth. For the LIGO, presently, the, all the sources are close enough that this is only a very small correction, but for future events, it may not be. Okay. Well, thank you very much for all your attention and the many good questions. Unfortunately, this year they decided to cancel that event, but they are organizing uh, a part of it uh, to go ahead anyway, and that's the uh, Astrophotography School. And we have one of their organizers here, if you want to come down, sure. uh, who is here to talk a little bit about that and give you a bit of information about the program. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Can you open that? Perhaps. Um, one of the right, far right one. Hold on. I'll just get you to switch. <coughs> you just toggle when I have to. Anyway, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Ralph very much for inviting me here. Uh, and I won't take more than a couple of minutes of your time. Um, uh, and on behalf of our president, Gary Bennett, uh, 
uh, we'd like to bring, he'd like to bring readings to you from Hamilton Center. It's great being here, and that was an excellent talk, and I'm glad I came. Uh, not for this, but for him. It was great. Um, anyway, uh, so my name's Ed Mizzi, and I'm on a, a small committee with a guy named Bob Pochuk and Andy Blanchard. Um, last year at the General Assembly in London, uh, we had AstroCats, as was just mentioned, and part of that was a CAPS program, uh, the Canadian Astrophotography Schools. That was the first year. Uh, we started then, and we're having a second uh, annual event on May 6th and 7th. Uh, and basically, um, it's a two-day event. Um, it's being held at a high school in Milton. We thought that would be convenient for a lot of people because the 401 is close there, and it's not far from, from Hamilton and Burlington, Oak Hill, and so on. Um, two-day event, and basically, uh, there are three courses. Uh, the first one, if you'll go to the second, next slide, please. Uh, Ron Gretcher, some of you may know, know him, he's doing a course on uh, PIX Insight, which, uh, which is a relatively new, not really new, but relatively new software uh, to process uh, images. Um, excellent software, and he's uh, one of the experts on, on that software. Uh, so if you are into imaging uh, and you want to learn more about processing, that would be the course you would take, and that course would go over the two days uh, it would be about four hours per day in a classroom in the high school. Um, and he's, uh, I won't read all that to you, but uh, he's, he's uh, you know, well uh, versed in the program and in astrophotography. He's been doing it for many, many years. Uh, the second course, uh, Jim Chung, some of you may know that uh, name. Um, he's uh, uh, going to do a talk. One day is going to be on planetary Photography and the other day is going to the other day is going to be on solar photography and uh, we we basically uh, coerced him into doing the solar. He was going to do two days of planetary, but because of the eclipse in August that you all know about, uh, he's going to talk to, to uh, taking pictures of that. Uh, and the third course uh, is Richard Wright. Um, I actually um, uh, helped uh, monitor this course last year. I was sort of his little helper, but I got to sit in with it. Uh, he was excellent, and so for anyone beginning in astrophotography, uh, and it doesn't mean you have to image deep sky objects, uh, it could be as simple as doing star trails, uh, or just taking uh, pictures of uh, the moon, um, but anyway, he's the guy, he's coming up from the States, um, he's involved with uh, software BISC, uh, which produces lots of different um, uh, software, and uh, another great speaker. Uh, another slide, please. Uh, so this is the flyer I'm going to leave um, Ralph with a bunch of these. Uh, we'll leave them down here. You're welcome to take one on your way uh, out. Uh, on the front it has all the information you really need with a website if you wanted to enroll. Um, and on the back, uh, which is the last page, if you go back to the next one, sorry. No, other way. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, has, uh, if you want to mail in uh, your uh, choice of course, you can do that as well. It's probably a lot easier on the web, but it really doesn't matter. Um, so we uh, would really like to welcome you um, and uh, encourage, if you are interested or you want to get interested in astrophotography, uh, this would be one of the places to do it. These events don't happen very often, and we thought, because a lot of our uh, members are into this sort of thing, that, you know, why not uh, have this available to people? Uh, the last thing I'll say is that the, the greatest thing about these courses is that, is that they're all hands-on. So you will be asked um, to bring a laptop with you. Uh, they will provide any software you need or any um, uh, data you need, um, a laptop, and you will get to work on it right there and then, and you've got these people helping you along the way. Uh, any questions? Anyway, I'll leave the, uh, the flyers down here. Please take one if you're interested at all, and then uh, Ralph will keep them for his next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and we'll close off with uh, some uh, announcements now, so we can go bring up the announcements. Take my here. Uh, right up there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, Ralph. Yeah, 
There's two of us running the mouse. So. <laughs> 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 getting used to you. <laughs> too many cooks. <laughs> All right, so here we go with the uh, uh, announcement. So our next meeting is a recreational astronomy night, and thank you for mentioning the uh, eclipse and uh, Jim's uh, uh, talk about uh, photogra uh, photography because that night we are going to be talking about uh, the eclipse itself. So after Dennis Gray does the sky this month, Michael Watson, who uh, started uh, eclipse chasing about the same time I did, uh, way, way back, is going to talk a little bit about uh, the exact circumstances of the eclipse and where you can go to see it. And then I'll be talking about uh, eye safety and uh, how to select solar filters. And there's a lot of them out there now uh, to uh, choose from. And there's some really interesting designs as well. They're not all just those cardboard uh, glasses anymore. Okay, two weeks after that, we have our next speaker's night, uh, and uh, the speaker that evening will be Casey Moore from the uh, Earth and Space <coughs> Science Program at York University, and his talk is going to be an interesting one. Is Martian weather worse than winter in Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on which year, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, Casey will tell us all about that and we'll be able to draw our own conclusions. <coughs> okay, uh, for those of you who are new members, who's uh, here for the first time tonight? Oh, we've got a couple of people. Great. Yeah. Uh, start uh, for tonight's talk. But uh, First Light is a three session series of meetings that will be held here at the Science Center. Uh, beginning on the evening of uh, April 26th, and that's an introductory series of talks about uh, the RASC and uh, various activities that we carry on, and it is part of your membership benefit. So uh, you can sign up for this online, and there's information about the First Light program in the issue of scope that was issued today. So we'll have a uh, look at that. Okay, solar observing, uh, one of our monthly uh, events. Uh, the next regular session uh, that we do every month uh, on the first Saturday will be on May the 6th uh, from 10 until noon and Sean down here at the front is the person who is responsible for making the go-no-go -no -go call for those events. Similarly, we've got our dark sky parties. Um, so uh, the uh, dark sky party uh, up at Long Sioux will be on the 24th through 27th of April, first clear night. Uh, and City Star Party for uh, learning how to observe things in the murk <coughs> in the city uh, takes place at Bayview Village Park, not too far from here, uh, first clear night of the first through the fourth of May. And uh, again, we've got the go and no go calls in our usual channels. Also, we've got a special event for International Astronomy Day on uh, the 29th of April. So it'll start with 10 o'clock in the morning with our uh, solar observing that day. So it's a special program. Again, Sean will make the go no go call. And then I think it's Allard who is organizing the uh, no go or go call for the star party. That will go from, I believe it's 8 until 10 that evening. Or is it? Uh, uh, the whole program is scheduled to be 10.30, but 10 uh, telescopes are going to be starting set up at 8, so I'm going to have an 8.18, I think is the time that's on. Okay, well, we'll, we'll yeah. set up for 8 o'clock and we'll go as long as the sky allows us, and we'll see what happens. But uh, that'll be a chance to... Uh, uh, celebrate there will story. also be solar observing uh, mm -hmm. during. In Rome? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, Rob. Yeah, during and for International Astronomy Week, which is the week prior to Saturday, every clear day that week we'll have solar observing yeah. from ten. Starting from to Monday on. Starting from Monday. Yes. Okay. So from the twenty-four. Twenty-four. Okay. 24. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's going to be a full week of astronomy. Free uh, parking, right? Ah, uh, yes, that's the other thing. Uh, for those of you who are coming to help out for that, tell the uh, parking lot attendant that you are coming in as a volunteer for the program yes. and you get into the parking lot without having to ante up. That's one of the benefits. Yeah. 
your membership yeah. card. Bring your membership card. Send me your name yes. beforehand. I can put your name on the list as well. Mm -hmm. All right. There will be more details about that on the website as we come closer to that. Day. Okay. Other things. Uh, again, just a reminder that your membership benefit includes uh, access to the Car Astronomical Observatory near Thornbury. And uh, again, the road, the, the road is now open. It hasn't been properly graded yet. So uh, if you decide to go up there, watch it because there's a lot of potholes and uh, more than potholes, it's sort of pot ruts <laughs> along the road because of the uh, spring thaw. So uh, anyway, a um, lot more information about getting there on the website. First supervised weekend is the first weekend of yeah. That's right. Thank you. Okay, um, another membership benefit is uh, the Telescope Loan Program. We have at least a couple of the program managers here this evening. So, uh, Peter, Mark, George isn't here tonight, is he? Or is he up there? Let's see. Okay. Anyway, uh, so we've got a couple of the uh, loan administrators here that can talk with you if you're interested in finding out more about more and more about instruments. Okay, going on as we speak is Yuri's night. In fact, that's why Allard isn't here because he mm -hmm. came to help uh, Reed set up um, with this and then we'll decamp down to the Yuri night celebration uh, at the uh, uh, downtown location. So uh, they're saying that they're open until 11, so there's enough time you can get down there downtown to, to join in the festivities. They're hoping that all of the food gets eaten up, which is another reason why they want people to come. And uh, admission has been cut to $10 tonight uh, at the door if you go down there. So uh, I promised I uh, would uh, encourage people. Uh, we are uh, partnering with them and giving away memberships as door prizes. As well. Okay, and finally, for those of you who do not want to go all the way downtown, uh, some of us will fight our way across Eglinton Avenue uh, to the Granite Brewery over at. Uh, Mount Pleasant Road and uh, have something there instead. Okay, so that's basically the meeting after the meeting and all are welcome. We'll you get downtown faster, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I noticed that there was a sign that the part of Edmonton that was closed at 9 o'clock, but I can't remember whether it's between here and Mount Pleasant or if it's on the other side. <laughs> okay. okay, so two weeks tonight, uh, our next meeting. See you then. Thanks very much for coming.